yeah, let's let's get started. I hope you enjoyed the conference. I have two announcements to make. First one is that you can write my presentation in, in the mobile app. And the second announcement is that if you want to hear about functional Java and stuff like that, you can join Michal and Krzysiek in room two or three. It should be also a great talk as they got over a hangover and stuff like that. So a word about myself. My name is Maciek Pruchniak. I came from Warsaw from a company called Talk. We are not so small software house. And I'm working mainly on stream processing stuff with Scala and uh, stuff like that. We have, I've been in, in Krakow uh, quite a few times this year, but most of the time I was talking about my uh, current project. This is Talk Nuss Knacker, and it deals with stream processing, GUI, uh, user interfaces, and so on. So you may wonder what I, the hell I'm doing here, right? Because this is supposed to be a talk more or less about Spring. Don't worry, it won't be a rant because I think Spring is a great framework. I've been using it from time to time for more than 12 years. I remember this liberating feeling when I first started using it at like 2000, uh, 2006. And how it was liberating from, from I don't know, ser old servlets or EJBs and stuff like that. But years passed. I started using different technologies like Scala and so on. And Spring also got through many interesting transformations. For example, introductions of Spring Boot, it gained popularity, it gained I don't know, power, let's say it. And recently, I felt that everybody is using only Spring. People coming for our job interviews, they are Spring, Spring, Spring. Java developer is Spring developer, just like mm, Ruby developer is Rails developer. And I've started feeling like kind of strange about it. And then I've seen a tweet of a friend of mine, Milan Diakov. He's also he's a really great, great speaker. If you have a chance of hearing him, listening to him, don't hesitate. And he tweeted, sometimes I wish I had the power to make the whole Spring stack disappear for a week. Then sit down and watch how half of the Java developers in the world run around screaming, oh my god. And I felt, yeah, this is so true. I felt it quite a few times. So let's talk about it. Because I felt it a few times. For example, when we did, uh, we made kind of custom integration platform for mobile operator. It was some kind of ESB, but better, of course. We were using SGI and stuff like that, and we didn't want to use Spring. So I approached my friends who worked, who were supposed to write code on that platform, and said, OK, you can configure this matrix and stuff like that with these two lines of code or these two lines of XML. And they started saying, yeah, but with Spring, I would be able to do it with one annotation. I was saying, yeah, yeah, but here you can, you know, write these two lines of code, just two lines. Yeah, but one annotation, one annotation, or three lines of XML. It's not that bad. Yeah, but I will be able to enable everything, everything with, in Spring with one annotation. And this is one of the rare moments when they pissed me off. So, yeah. And... The, the next case was when we were supposed to build some really, really secure and reliable stuff for our client. And there was a suggestion to build it without any external dependencies, including Spring. So my friend approached me and said, OK, Magic, but how, how will we expose anything to the web, right? Without Spring just using plain Java, uh, Java stuff. Am I supposed to? to write this web XML like 15 years ago. And I said, yeah, Miha, but you know, quite a few years ago, serverless 3.1 came. Why did you just use it? Huh? Serverless 3.1? I can do annotations and expose serverless with that? So he gradually, gradually ceased to notice what happens in the rest of the Java JE world, because everything was covered with Spring which is easy to use, well-documented, and so on and so forth. And the last thing to kind of, last example of, of the moment when maybe you should try to think about something different than Spring is, of course, job interview. Some of my friends has this question, how would you implement a simple proxy forwarding request with some additional headers? And I was asking them, OK, so what's the correct answer? I don't know, but I know what is not the correct answer. 
incorrect answer is to take Spring Boot and implement this proxy using Spring, right? So, of course, in most of the circumstances, it's good to use Spring. It's well tested, it's kind of battle tested, well documented, you can do everything you want with that. But th there are certain situations when we want to use something different. And I think it would be kind of good kind of thought experiment to think about it in kind of safe space like we he have here in this conference, uh, not to end up in a place like this. This is supposed to be, I think, largest Polish retailer uh, during, during some breakdown. So maybe we should start to think kind of calmly, what would we do if you have like two or three microservices okay, and some standards like exposing some API, consuming some REST API, accessing database layer, and how would, would we apprehend it uh, without Spring, using something different? And then the question, especially with, with some of the, our younger developers is, but with what? Spring is de facto standard, so maybe we can resort to real standards. And the first thing that probably comes to your mind is something that was called JEE, but currently is supposed to be, uh, I don't really remember, Jakarta E or JEE Guardians or whatever. So I won't come into the details because I'm still trying to catch what they are up to. But there are quite a few, or at least two of them, different approaches to standardization of, of many of the features that Spring has. And one of them is microprofiles. It's kind of standardization effort led by some Eclipse project, which is aimed specifically at microservices and stuff. And when you look at their page, it looks pretty promising. They have some APIs for open tracing, exposing uh, APIs, REST client configuration, metrics, fault tolerance, and so on and so forth. So far, so good. It looks really interesting. But what about implementations? There are some of them, it turns out. But at least for me, they are no, not so widely, know, widely known. One of the more widely known is called Wild Light Swarm. They used to have a web page that looked like Spring in its initializer project. So yeah, like three months ago when I first did this talk, I used Wild Flying Swarm. In the meantime, I learned it's no longer Wild Flying Swarm. It's called Thorntail. Okay, so they have all these nice APIs like JAX, RS, CDI, and stuff like that. And you can build some stuff with that. So I tried to do kind of simple service as would you do in Spring, and to deploy it and run it uh, inside my ID. And this is what after some fiddling with documentations I came up with. So here I defined some small data source. This doesn't look too bad, but then, for some reason, I had to write this boilerplate code. It was not really well documented. It works, right? It exposes some REST API, it has access to database, everything is nicely written, but somehow I wouldn't like to write this code for the second time. So, so far, so good for microprofiles. I wouldn't be myself if I didn't mention to you my, one of my favorite technologies, and that is SGI. This is another effort, quite, I would say, aging for more than 15 years, effort of standardization. And there are quite a few interesting projects built upon um, SGI containers like Apache Caraf, Ares, Ops4j, and all of them aim you to provide, well, certain set of features similar to what Spring Spring Boot does. So they have their own implementations of JTI, JPA, JNDI, and stuff like that. Everything you need in more or less enterprise service. But do they have something like Spring Boot? And the answer is, you know, they do. They have something called Caraf Boot, which aims to be more or less something like Spring Boot. If you look up the page, it's not so lively anymore, but hopefully something will come up out of it. And even in our, mm, in our company, when we developed some uh, services based on Caraf and SGI, we came up with 
a very similar uh, to Spring Boot Initializer, when you can click through your dependencies and see what's happening. And now I want to show you the best of all. This is the best demo that I have. I don't have too many of them, but look. Now, I package this application and stuff. And do you see that? I run it. Do you see this SK art? Isn't it great? Yeah. And it has even console with access to SQL and stuff like that. So this Karaf project is really, yeah, a project that has SKR in shell is pretty much mature. I think so. So does it have Spring Boot? Well, sort of. Because if you look for documentation and tutorials, uh, you'll have some certain difficulties. And the SGI suffers from bad fame. This is not just some random Java developer. This is Mario Fusco, who's Java champion. So yeah, the fact that he's so pissed off with Spring means something. So you know, I like SGI very much, but the quality of documentation and stability of everything is kind of, well, I'd say disputable. So this ends up the part of my talk when I'm talking about standards and how can they replace Spring and Spring Boot. So I think it won't be that bad if you try to use them. You can do most of the things that you can do with Spring Framework or Spring Boot. Of course, the documentation will be worse. And sometimes you will have to write some boilerplate code. But on the other hand, most of your, or at least mine, services really don't need such many fancy uh, fancy features like Spring has. So you can easily get away with Java E or whatever it's called, MicroProfile, OSGI, and stuff like that. But on the other hand, you may very well say, OK, but these are just imitations, right? These are imitations, and as far as I'm concerned, not too perfect imitations. So maybe we should rather use the original stuff. So the standards are kind of ambiguous, not too, not too good. They, are, they really need a lot of more effort to, to, to become kind of more usable. So maybe let's think about something different, how to replace fr Spring Framework. Maybe let's replace the word framework. Because when you think about framework, there's one important distinction that is quite well known, but let's look old. So this is the distinction between framework and library, right? When you have framework, it's the framework that kind of dictates the architecture or of your application, provides you with some kind of templates, and then you just plug in your more or less complex business logic. Whereas in, when you program with libraries, you are the authors of design of architecture of your application, and then only use libraries for certain, certain features like deployment, monitoring, endpoints, all kinds of cross-cutting stuff. So how would we look at Spring, right? There are many, many, many modules, like MVC, Day, Spring Data, JMS, various cloud stuff, actuator, security, and whatever. But deep down inside, there's this core, right? The core beans or whatever you call it. And what is it? In essence, it's inversion of control container, which more or less amounts to these two annotations or maybe three more, right? There's component, auto wire, and everything is made up for you. And if you think about it a little bit, you might think, OK, this, is, this is just defines as a big hash map of, of the beans and methods to automatically wiring it. I heard it somewhere in, in my company and I was kind of proud of it. And you can think after a while two things. First, if it's hash map, then maybe we shouldn't worry that much. Maybe it's not some complex magic and we can live without it. And the second thing is, do I really want in my carefully crafted application to have this big hash map? Now I'm starting to be, to be maybe a, just a little bit controversial, so I resort to authorities. In May, uh, Tomer Gebel uh, gave pretty nice presentations about IOC and stuff like that. 
in Geekon, and he said, if you are seeing benefit from IOC, your code base is already out of control. So at first you may think, why, why, why? I need IOC if my I don't know, code base is, is bigger than some small pet project, right? I need it, I need it, I need, I need it. But then, there are a few presentations popping here and there that try to convince you that this is not the case. And two of them were given this year or last year by my, by my good old friends. One is Kuban Abrudalik, it was called Keep IT Clean, Mid-Size Building Blocks and Hexagonal Architecture. Another by Dominic, who will also give great talk, I'm sure, tomorrow. And last year he was talking about portent adapters. And this is about kind of slicing or decomposing your application into smaller modules without many layers of tangled dependencies. So uh, when you take one of the slides from Kuba's presentation, it looks like this, right? This is how he defines API or facade on one of his modules or packages. He wires the stuff by hand, right? And only after a while, when he defined the facade, he exposes this, this as being, he injects configuration inside. But when you think about it, he did most of the stuff by himself, right? By hand. Why do he need Spring for that? Do he? Maybe he can replace also the wiring of the packages by himself. And the same thing is with ports and adapters. If you think about it, what, uh, what Dominic preached and also Kuba, what they preach is that inside your application, you have your core, your domain logic, which is central to your application, and you write it with plain code, with plain Java. And only outside, you have this thin layer of adapter, support, services integration. So inside, you don't need Spring. This should be plain Java. And outside, this layer should be thin, uh, thin enough so that maybe you don't need Spring. But if you were to do it by hand, then what would you do? And again, I resort to authority, this time of Adam Varsky, while at this Geekon or somewhere in the blog, sorry for <laughs> mentioning competition conference to the organizers, but yeah, Geekon was good this year. So he said, don't fear the main. And this is the stuff that I learned from, uh, from my friends at Software Mill. This, this approach is kind of more prevalent in, in Scala community, I believe, but it's also valid in Java. Of course, I don't mean this type of main, right? Because in all, all, all of our microservices, you can see this kind of main. But I'm thinking about something a little bit more elaborate. So what would you do if you were to wire the, the dependencies by yourself? Would it look really scary or not? We would do something like this. OK, we have this data source take configuration, we define some repository, JPI or whatever, we'll come to that in a moment. And then some facade, API or, or whatever, inject dependency, one, another, a right. few packages, few dependencies, that should be all. Does this scare you? If you are scared by that, you can leave, I won't take offense. But. I think it should be enough in, in, in many cases. So the lessons that I take from that is that you can live without IOC container. Wire up dependencies by yourself. What's more, there's some additional benefit because it can enforce better design. Because with Spring, it's too easy to wire things together to add dependencies. And if you have tangled dependencies in your code base, then it should hurt. And if you wire dependencies by yourself, then it will hurt. So it's OK, right? In Spring, you just put here and there auto wire annotation. And it doesn't hurt because before it's too late, right? And one additional benefit of hand wiring is also you can do it in on kind of smaller scale. For example, if you are worried about that or you are afraid to, to experiment, you can take just, I don't know, one package, one fragment of your application, wire the things together, check out how dependencies look like, and only then move to kind of broader scope. 
Okay, so this is about kind of construction applica of application and the dependencies and so on. Now let's move to other kind of common things you want to do in your application. So the first one is data access. And again, here Spring is really prevalent. They have this great Spring data framework which enables us to do this beautiful handicraft methods. Fortunately, this one fits it line, one line, but you can easily get, uh, get longer, of course. And without Spring, well, we can't do this, but maybe it's better, right? I mean, there are some imitations of, of frameworks like that, but again, there are imitations. So maybe let's go back to medieval times, like five or ten years ago, when we used to have this repository with even three methods that we had to write by ourselves. Again, these won't be auto-generated without Spring. Huh. And what can we use when we don't have Spring data? Well, there are quite a few possibilities. I'll start with kind of standard stuff that many people love, sorry, Eric, with Hibernate or JPA. But this is what most of us uh, probably use underneath a Spring Data. So how to wire, set up, configure Hibernate or JPA by yourself? Uh, like a few years ago when I last tried it, it was really complicated, but it turns out that the situation is getting better and better. It's not that difficult anymore, right? Okay, you need this like five lines of XML, you need this like five lines of code, but then you're done, right? Of course, with Spring you do it with one annotation, but this amount of boilerplate still doesn't kind of scare me off, right? So it's not that bad. And then again, you won't have auto-generated code uh, by, by Spring Data. But okay, you can use Criteria API from GPI, you can use HQL. And there's a few lines here, a few lines there, and we're living, right? It will work just as good, right? And at least you have kind of more control how it really works. And if you don't like Hibernate or JPA like many people do, there's also quite a few kind of smaller libraries, very interesting. One of them is JDBI, right? It's kind of more like simple, smaller wrapper around SQL that doesn't hide from you the complexities of um, relational mapping and stuff like that. So you can use just select. It will be more or less automatically mapped to your beans. You can use select. You can bind variables. It's kind of pretty easy to use. Of course, until you want to do, where have I got this? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> until you want to do paging. Paging is difficult outside of JPA and Hibernate. You can get away with some simple stuff if you have mm, kind of well-behaving databases, but in most cases you will suffer, right? So some things are more easy, some things are more difficult, but again, this is the code that shouldn't scare you off, right? If you are brave developers. The thing that should scare you off a little bit is transactions, our transactions, right? <coughs> Again, there's a great talk tomorrow about JPAs and tra transactions, but as far as I, uh, as I see, most developers nowadays just put transactional annotation here and there, and they don't care what is happening inside. So in the simpler frameworks or libraries, you have to be a little bit more careful. In fact, in Spring, you also have to be careful. They provide you with, uh, with some callbacks or kind of advice like methods that you can use. But if you want to understand what hides uh, deep inside Spring transactional API, Spring transactional stuff, well, you have to encounter transaction-aware data source proxy. This is one of the magic Spring, uh, Spring classes that does the job. So if you want to wire up transactional stuff together, you have to uh, wire up quite, quite complex stuff. Please don't copy the code, it won't work. This is difficult and this is the part then where you can have to be really careful like to, to, to achieve the ease of use of Spring. Mm, transactions, right? So, 
here documentation is really needed. And when you talk about transactions, you may also wonder, what about NoSQL, right? Because Spring Data gives us this kind of layer of abstraction that should abstract from us the the differences between NoSQL databases being Mongo, or Redis, or whatever. And the thing is that I think that this can be a little bit dangerous, because why do we want to use NoSQL database? Probably have good reasons, performance reasons, or data modeling reasons. And when it's abstracted away by these auto-generated methods, then you can lose a lot of power of the NoSQL database Sorry, that you are using. For example, take Redis. This is just a fragment of. <coughs> so <coughs> Sorry about that. It's autumn. This is just a fragment of API of Redis. And when you hide all the complexities of the API with Spring Data, you may end up with kind of with many performance bottlenecks. We've tried did some time ago to use Redis with Spring Data, and we figured out that outside of kind of really simple stuff, uh, Spring Data generated, generated really kind of ineffective Redis queries because it tried to be everything to everyone, right? So for NoSQL, it's quite often viable to just use some, uh, I would say, more specific interfaces than to just use Spring Data. Now, we've talked about mm, access to data. What about exposing and consuming REST interfaces or something like that? In this case, again, we have two options. One is to go with kind of default mm, approach provided also by Spring. For example, to use JAX-RS, to use Jetty, but do the wiring by hand, right? Not just some annotations, but to explicitly start server serving our API. So how do we do it? Well, first we define the API with JAX-RS annotations. This is exactly, almost exactly the same way as you would do with, with, with Spring stuff. Of course, now they have this data flow stuff and reactive, but we don't want to go into that. But how to run it, how to expose it? It turns out, again, it's not that difficult. We define a port we want to run, run. We define our endpoints, and then, 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 few lines, few lines. The server is starting. We join the thread so that our application is not ending. And what else? Of course, the parentheses, right? And we invoke the method in our main. And again, there's some boilerplate, but it fits in like one small method. So it's not, nothing to worry about. And now we see what is happening, that it's jetty and not, I don't know, netty, undertow, or God knows what, whatever implementation of JAX arrays that is provided by Spring or Servlet container. We have some control over it. And if you want to, if you don't want to use annotations, if you don't want to use JAX arrays, well, there's quite a lot of different smaller and bigger frameworks and libraries that provide you with such capabilities. So I've picked just random one, it's called Ratpack, but there are a lot of them. And most of them are, can be quite popular. They have like thousands, few thousand stars on GitHub. So somebody probably uses them. And what, how would we define such a web API in Ratpack? Well, this time it's more like, hmm, code convention known from, I don't know, like HTTP or other Scala stuff. So we define some handlers. We define on which paths we want to react. We produce some JSON. Here, things can be a little bit more wary because we have to uh, extract the query parameters, query paths. But again, not so bad. Here, again, they, 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 they have... Uh, and they try to be more kind of non-blocking, reactive, and if you want to use database, it's not so easy. But again, this code is not so long. It's quite easy to understand, and it works, right? So this is all we need to, to expose this kind of API using Ratpack or whatever other library. 
Now you may say, OK, so we defined the access to database. We defined web APIs. But this is just for toy, toy projects, right? And my production ready microservice has to have metrics, health checks, injection of configuration, exposing to cloud, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So what about those? Can we add such cross-cutting capabilities without Spring? And it turns out it's not so difficult. There are a lot of cases that you just have to plug in, right? For example, metrics. Long before Spring invented micrometer, there were code hell metrics. You can just plug it, them in, and they work pretty seamlessly. And for example, about health checks. If you think about it, uh, only the idea is the most important thing, that, that you have this health check and the endpoint when, where a service can define is it OK or not OK. And then you can just have longer or a more or less complicated inf interface when you define such health check by yourself. You can wire it up, and it should work, right? Another such uh, another uh, kind of thing that you usually mm, use in your Spring application is wiring, wi wiring up configuration, right? Normally, you would use this value annotation, you inject the configuration, you can use arbitrarily complex spell expressions inside, yeah. and the configurations will be injected. But there are also other ways to do this, and I want to tell just a little bit about little known outside Scala community, and this is type safe configuration, right? There you define your configuration something like more or less like JSON, and then there's this Java library, it's usually used by Scala developers, but, but it's a Java library, you can safely use it. You load the configuration from, I don't know, resources, class path, or whatever, or from a file. And then the nice thing that types of configuration gives you is the ability to define yeah, types of configuration, right? You don't have to rely on properties or whatever. You can define a class kind of bean with your configuration, and it can be automatically populated using, uh, using this type safe configuration stuff from this JSON, right? And then you have nice configurations that you can inject in all your services and have kind of type safety, right? So again, this is kind of small library that you can pick up, use, and it will, and it will work, right? Now, what about different kinds of metrics, Swagger APIs, I don't know, Zipkin tracing, or whatever. Hmm. How much time do I have? My timer is running up. OK, still some minutes, great. So let's have a look. Let's leave the OSGI. And now let's leave micro profiles. And uh, what about REST Enterprise main? So we go back to our uh, example when we started Jetty Container with our serverlet implementations. And then if we read a few pages of documentation, we can spot that we can register stuff like open API documentation. We can register supports from Zipkin or other open tracing support. We can register metrics and stuff like that. Again, most of the stuff is written somewhere. Maybe it's not as well documented as Spring counterparts, but it still works pretty seamlessly, right? So when you mm, when you add support uh, of the stuff, you can you can, for example, access metrics just like with uh, your normal metrics in in Code Hail, and access some some applications and stuff like that, and we can even use without much configuration, we can use Zipkin, right? I've invoked some of the uh, REST, uh, REST APIs there, and it should, uh, no, I invoked, uh, I've invoked my, uh, my REST APIs that I exposed using either Redpacks or 
uh, or jersey. And then in my Zipkin console, I can see them. It works, right? Here I have jersey. Somewhere, somewhere I should also have, I think so, yeah. They collaborate, right? I have one microservice using, uh, written using Radpack, one using JaxRS in Jersey, and here in Zipkin I can see, right? This is Radpacks. I don't know if you can see it but because the screen is small, but we can see that they communicate. It's not, it's not so difficult to do. Also for the Radpack version. Again, here the situation is a little bit different. We have to implement different APIs. But again, I can define some health check using some normal Java 8 lambdas. And then I register health check, I register metrics, tracing, and stuff like that. So most of the stuff is already there. That, yeah, somebody put quite a lot of effort to, to implement all this stuff in many, many libraries outside Spring. We just happen, I think at least, not to know it. Right, so all of this stuff is usually quite easily, uh, quite easy to wire up. And if it's not, you can implement it by yourself. And what about cloud, Netflix stuff, serverless, blah, 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 blah. I won't go into details of that for two reasons. So the one reason is that we don't have too much time. Another reason is I don't feel like an expert. But there's also a third reason, and the thing is that all of this is changing so rapidly that probably in half a year, things will change. Like a year or two years ago, Ribbon and Netflix stuff was all the hype. And if you go to GitHub and see Netflix, one of the Netflix projects like Ribbon, you can see, yeah, folks, it's on the maintenance. Now in Netflix, we are, we are using something completely different, like JRPC, I don't re recall. So everything is uh, happening quite fast in this space. But nevertheless, uh, we can see some trend of removing uh, many of the code that deals with final resiliency, discovery, load balancing, outside of our microservices applications. When you see stuff like and service meshes, uh, Istio, which is Envoy, Istio, which is already mentioned by Nathaniel mm, today, you can see that there is a prevalent trend to, to remove the code uh, that deals with auto discovery, resilience, I don't know, circuit breaking, to additional kind of additional containers, additional uh, smaller applications. And to let mm, to let your your Java microservices communicate with other just by local host API. So probably in short time we don't have we won't have to worry which kind of client libraries we will use. We'll just use simple stuff, communicate via loopback interface, and everything will be handled by I don't know some God Kubernetes or or whatever. Right. So. We can see that there are many things that we can do by hand. Now, time to wrap up a little bit. So, now I will show you one of the answers to Milan's tweet. And this is by Neil Bartlett, who is, of course, biased because he's an OSGI fan. But nevertheless, I think he has, uh, uh, yeah, he's quite right. He said, I think they would say, oh, wait, I never really needed half of that shit. And he's right, because probably we don't need half of that. Well, maybe it's not shit. But on the other hand, we probably need the other half. Because Spring did many great things. It gave us many ideas how systems should be designed. It exposed mm, the ideas of health checks, metrics, auto, auto uh, kind of auto wiring of uh, cross cutting concerns to, to, to white kind of swaths of developers. It gave us APIs that we can look and learn from. And what is the most important stuff? Spring gave us excellent documentations and tutorials that we can learn 
and try to apply the lessons we learn from them in different circumstances. Because when you think about it, we are developers, we want to use Spring, and we see it like kind of homogeneous almost API, but underneath there are a lot of libraries. And sometimes Spring gives us a lot of value outside of these core libraries, and sometimes Spring is just a thin layer adding, I don't know, some defaults, auto wiring, and stuff like that. But most of the heavy lifting, the core stuff, is done by the libraries itself, right? So I think we shouldn't be mm, too much afraid, too much scared of doing by ourselves things like manual dependency injection, about writing some glue code to, to, to wire a few libraries together, and to figure out some defaults that will work for us. We shouldn't just rely on Spring to, to, to provide us with, with this stuff, because it's easy enough. And then we can reach uh, quite good results with that. For example, when we roll some kind of uh, integration platform without Spring using Caraf and, and OSGI, and sometimes later our client went to microservices workshop and said, okay, but we, we have most of this stuff already on our platform, done by ourselves. Okay, it's not working that well. It doesn't have a ton document of documentations and tutorials on YouTube, but still it's there, right? So it's, many of the things are not so hard to do. On the other hand, there are quite a few things that you shouldn't do by yourselves, and these are transaction, dealing with threats and stuff like that, and most of all, security. This is probably what we shouldn't do <laughs> by ourselves, but resort to some wiser, wiser people writing better li libraries than we would do. And to sum up, I don't think that after the talk you should stop using Spring if you do it already. Probably you'll do it. It's okay. But some, from time to time, I think it's a good kind of mental exercise to think how would you define your implement your service without Spring, with something different, right? Maybe try to do it by yourselves, using different libraries, just for fun, not, not necessarily to, to deploy it in production. Because it turns out that these libraries are getting better and better, and I think it's because Spring raises this bar pretty high, especially when it comes to ease of use, documentations, and so on. So other libraries, if they don't want to fall out, they have to follow. And their documentation, their APIs, their defaults are getting better and better. So it's good to check them out. And this kind of ends of my talk. If you have any questions, please do. And if not, enjoy, enjoy the rest of conference. And you can give me some feedback on these, this mobile API, uh, mobile app or whatever. Thank you very much.